So it's so wonderful to be here. And uh, a very warm thank you to Miko. Oh, I don't know where you are. Thank you for putting this together, and thank you for having us here today. It's, it's a real pleasure, uh, and I'm full of gratitude for you setting up an event like this. Andre, others, uh, the whole team, you've been wonderful since I've been here, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about systems of systems. And the whole story starts with, you made it. You're here, you made a system. You have sketch assets. You have your code library, maybe you even have some tokens, right? If you know what tokens are, and you, you have your documentation. And it's in the world, it's in the wild. You have people that are using it, hopefully. And so you made a design system. What I'd like to talk about today is how you have a place in the world of how your product experiences are made. How you answer the question, why are we here, in the form of, who do we relate to? And how do those relationships work? When people see your system, they grab onto, if they are just being introduced to systems for the first time, the most tangible of things they get out of it. Those features that you offer of visual style, color, typography, space, shape, other properties, and all of the UI components that you make with them. Things like buttons and grids and inputs and tabs, and you offer those things so that other teams can work with the blank canvas that they have. They're making a product experience. And you offer them those bits so that they can take a grid and take those elements and start to form those into an expression that helps solve a problem. In this case, authenticate an experience. And that experience is made up not just of one, but many things. How do I create an account if I don't already have one? If I forget what my password is, how do I make that? And as a designer on a team responsible for authentication, they take those assets and they make a bunch of sketch files. They draw what the experience is. And at the same time, an engineer or two or three or four, depends on what your ratio is, transforms those things into code. Maybe it's a set of React templates or, or pages. And so you, as a maker of a system, suddenly are producing outputs, things like sketch assets and front-end HTML and CSS libraries. And those become the primary things that are consumed by a product squad, those designers, engineers, product managers, others. Those are the primary pieces of material they work with day to day. They live with those things. If you are making a successful system, you are a part of their lives, of their daily routine. And so there's the two things. But in fact, you as a person of systems know, if you've thought about tokens, that those sketch assets and UI components made in code are actually formed upon a basis of visual language. And we use design tokens to ascribe our decisions of a background color, the type color on top of that background color for primary text, things like the shape of our corners or the space of our inset. And we create tokens, an abstraction of what that visual language is, and we imbue that into the sketch assets, code, and other things. And in fact, that's not all. Those three bits all contribute to our own product that we make for our customers to use our product to make their product. The documentation site itself. Most systems teams that I work with take the bits of the system to make an experience to document the very thing that they're using. And so you start to think about all those different connections, even within your own team, to make your own system of systems for other people to use. And that documentation becomes an expression not just for the designer, not just for the engineer, but for everyone that engages with it. A product manager that wants a pithy introduction to know what the heck a carousel is. Or a QA specialist to see all those states of buttons. They all use the documentation. Today I'm going to talk about mostly that relationship. And as Gina said, code is truth. We want to get to that point. Most systems that have evolved and matured and are in the wild are some sort of front-end toolkit at their core. And that's how people perceive it. And they make a connection with that. They depend upon a certain version 
of what you have in your system. And that version they depend on becomes the hook into all the wonderful goodness that your system has to offer. And so you think about what are they thinking about? I'll often do a survey across the product organization and ask them questions, but I always end with two, and this is my favorite. Help me see what you think the future is in our organization with a design system. Imagine if it fails. 18 months from now, what two pieces of evidence can you give me that you could imagine being there? What is evident to help you understand that our system has failed? And then I followed up with the last question and just say success instead. If you ask them these open-ended questions, you will get a range of responses. And these fails help understand the fears that these teams have. The fears of a design system being too big, too monolithic, and so you need to craft an answer to the question, how am I supposed to adopt this thing? Well, some teams, big bang, all at once. Our squad's gonna stop for two or three sprints. We're gonna tear out that old crap we had before. We're gonna put in the new design system and forward we move. Some teams do that. Most teams, we're gonna take it one step at a time. We can't stop all the features we're working on day to day, but instead we need to take each bit over time as we continue to evolve our own product incrementally. And so if we're going to adopt it incrementally, how do we do that? What's our progression from the beginning to get to the top of that model? Mo mountain, rather. The, what are the possibilities we have to get from here to there? And so we create models. For better or worse, everyone starts as a non-adopter. They haven't even used the system before. But what's the next step? It's not hello world in production. It's understand the system, develop a plan, and maybe as a good faith gesture, start to invoke the code in your own system, a one-line piece that I'll talk about in a moment. And then, of course, you adopt the core visual style, you start to adopt all those little tiny atomic primitive elements, buttons and inputs, maybe a basic data table presentation, ultimately to get to the point where you've fully adopted an entire component library. These models vary across different teams, but the progression is similar. It's a maturation of your adoption of a design system. And they come with certain qualities like, if you want to stay at this level, stay fresh. <laughs> So I have conversations with product squads. Oftentimes it's 50 product squads, and these conversations happen over and over again. I introduce the system to them. There's about a 10-minute presentation. Talks about why we're doing it, consistency, consistency, efficiency, other qualities. But it gets to a point where I ask a question. Will you adopt this system? And I'm asking the team. I'm not asking the designer. I'm not asking the engineer. To be honest, I'm really looking at the product manager. Will you adopt this thing? Let the silence seep into the room and let them fill the answer. Because almost always the answer is, yes, we will adopt this system. When will you adopt this system? Oh, then the silence gets really uncomfortable. But if they say nothing, then you say, do you think you're going to start tomorrow? No. Are you going to start in 2019? Uh, no. OK, now we're starting to bracket the conversation, and we can have productive conversations around, when do you think you're going to create the plan? When will your lead engineer, your architect of your own product, take a look at the code? And when might you have a first example in production? And I look in the code. It might be something like a package JSON file in the root of their product's uh, code repository. And there's a very specific place where they list the dependencies. And I'll look for the system. And they'll even show me the version of the system they're on. That's step one. Can you just add that? That's actually the minimal form of good faith commitment that an engineer can make to simply get the access to the system in there. 
And so that means they need to choose a certain version of the system. Mature design systems are communicating clearly how the system's going to change over time. At Morningstar, this is a release history page. Okay, it's, well, you've seen these before. But every time we have a release, there are new things we have on offer. There are things that we've enhanced based on what we already had. And there might be some fixes. And so how are you communicating consistently those kinds of things every release, every two weeks, every month, every quarter? And that asks the question, what exactly are you versioning? You might have an entire system. It's versioned as an entire package. If you remember those tokens and the UI components and code and the sketch assets and the documentation site, we version that monolithically. We release that whole thing. Or maybe we're starting to break down those different pieces. We're starting to version tokens independently of sketch assets and documentation separately too. And across those different pieces that we version, it's the code and the sketch that we do our best to align, to keep in lockstep with one another, even though sometimes sketch gets behind code. Code never gets behind sketch, at least on the teams that I work on. Or maybe you version every single tiny item in your library. And so today's tools afford us that opportunity to do that. But it also begs certain questions. When you look at what I find a very wonderful and, and, and well-documented system at Atlassian, you see in their API docs all the different packages that they have on offer. And you look at the list and you see version numbers of every single one of these things. And goodness, conversation is on version 6.3.6. .6. I don't even know what a conversation component is. But that changes all the time, as opposed to analytics next is on 1.1.2. What do those version number mean? How is it changing? And so we look at individual components, and we see the list, and we call through that and try to understand, if I'm using an earlier version, what am I getting? And what risks am I taking by upgrading to a more recent thing? And so when you version by component, or you version smaller parts, it's going to invoke a lot of questions. And you, as a person making a system, need to be prepared to answer questions like, when you change a token upon which all components depend, do you uh, update all the components at the same time? Do you propagate that quickly? If you have buttons that's on this version and tabs that's on that version, can those things coexist? Because our button is old and we're not going to upgrade in the tabs we want to upgrade. Are they reflecting different eras of a design language? Can I use different versions of a button on the same page, or will they collide and have a big argument with one another visually? And frankly, I'm still on version 1.9 of a system, and the version's current release is 2.3, how do I look at the documentation of what I adopted? Those are just a smattering of example questions that the more you start to realize the impact of versioning and the relationship that they form by creating a dependency on you, you need to have answers to. You need to understand what in the world that number actually means. Semantic versioning suggests that the last number is a patch number. And Designers and other members of teams don't even have the literacy to understand that the middle number is a minor release. A colleague of mine, Micah, I like how he coined that. It's actually really a feature-by-feature -feature release. But it's that major number. It's an indication that things have changed and that you need to be wary of that change because it's a major release. That's what that name really conjures up this notion of massive change, complete redesign. And so every time we have a change in our design system team, we have a conversation. It's often in Slack. There's a designer like this asking a question, we're changing this in the release, is that a breaking change? Because as we approach the end of our sprint and we're gonna do another release, we need to identify the, re the version number of that release. And the conversation yields, yes, absolutely, versus no, it's not a breaking change at all. And then two other people that say, I don't know. 
Well, I'm not really sure. And so we were having these conversations over and over on our team, and what we began to realize was we haven't defined what we mean by major, minor, and patch releases within the context of a design system, particularly, particularly the context of a design system that, in addition to the API of each coded component, people depend on visual continuity and consistency. People care about their ability to include different things from different versions. And so at Morningstar, we defined what breaking changes mean. And so how does versioning work? Here are three, this is what semantic versioning means. But then in detail, we talk about what breaks. If we're going to do a 2.0, that means one of these things has broken and you need to be aware of it. For example, on our team, we consider the change of typographic properties like weight, line height, size, of typography that can potentially be displayed within a fixed UI setting. Not everybody is fluidly responsive in our adopters. And we consider that a breaking change of a heading component. We would have to upgrade or uptick from one to two the major release number. Similarly, the spacing around our components. If we have a card component and we have 16 pixels underneath and we decide to make the default space 32 instead, to me, the visual API, so to speak, has changed. That means you've broken the, uh, how it worked before and gone somewhere else. And if they upgrade their card component, they need to be prepared that it's not going to fit the same with all the other pieces within their design system. Those are pretty small changes. Yet, suddenly, that's a major version. It's backward and compatible, not just for the public API, but how the UI works, how it's manifested within the front end. And so the challenge that we have when we adhere to semantic versioning, we commit to being rigorous in our work, is that that doesn't necessarily mean sweeping refactoring is necessary in the product teams. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a radical redesign and a complete new visual language. But if a product manager sees that, they say, oh no, major release. I just adopted that three, nine, six months ago. I'm not upgrading because they remember how much it costs to adopt the initial thing, to change from their older, less rigorous, kind of systematic product build to rely upon the consistent formative system that you have that everybody's using. That was a big change. And so when they adopted version 1.0, they looked at their markup. Oh, they had to take all that stuff out and put all this new stuff in, and that took a lot of effort. And they look at the design outcomes of that, and they look, whoa, this is our old visual language, and now we're nice and shiny and new with the new visual language, but that's a change for our customers too. And the engineers that tooled in that dependency and started to weave their code with yours took effort. But sometimes a major release, actually it's minimal front-end impact. Changing the card, the heading might wrap, there are other things. And so upgrading and being disciplined with versioning also comes with the communication challenge of helping people understand how you're changing over time. And so that change over time starts to propagate in the relationships we have with multiple products. Let's say our design system is serving five different teams. And over time, they have adopted the system. They're on different versions of the system. But in general, this isn't too intimidating. 1.3, 1.1, 1.21, they're generally all in the roughly the same place. But this expresses to me a fundamental value. We are not there to govern. We are not there to stop. We are not there to block. We as systems see products, and it is still un up to them to achieve their own destiny. We are there to equip them to be successful. We are there to give to them. And frankly, they are there to take from us and make their product experiences better with a common foundation that many teams can share. And so we, as makers of systems, might see ourselves in the middle and see this scale happening 
all these different product squads in, in larger companies start to depend on the tools and the kits and the assets that we provide. And yet some of them remain disconnected from us. Why can't they reach us? It's because in between us and them are what I'll call intermediaries. And those types of intermediaries are themers, translators, and the first one I'll talk about, distributors. As you make systems at scale, and they start to be adopted across a wide range of different products, you'll run into entities that managed package dependencies for other teams. Often they're called platforms or other things. You'll hear from the team you want to adopt your system. We'd love to adopt your system. We really are excited about it. But we can't because the, the other team makes the decisions around what tools we're allowed to use. What you thought were a set of five products that were going to adopt your system, turns out it's a set of four other products who leverage the platform team's choices, and it's up to the platform team to adopt your system. This is actually an indicator of discipline. It's a projection of your system through one to four others, essentially for free on top of that. And to me, it's a signal of mature practices. As a person trying to propagate out systems, I look at that with respect. That's what we do. And the platform team is another node on that journey to getting the system to those other teams. But those other four teams can't get to us like the other product two and product three can. It's up to product two and product three to control their own destiny and upgrade when they want to, and they can operate independently. But if you're going to uh, upgrade the platform, suddenly that projection is an upgrade for everyone and they have to sync all their work together. So these distributors, like all of the decisions that we make, have trade-offs. And so most of the time, these distributors exist within the most mature products, often the bigger flagship products that are generating the most revenue, that are the most sophisticated and complicated. So you, you can't live without them, so get used to living with them. Forge stronger relationships with them. Those are, as, as I look at a portfolio and I find out that these distributors exist, those are among the first teams that I talk to. But it's still up to those other four teams to make the case for the value, because the platforms have a lot of things on their mind. And you telling them that there's these other four teams resonates a lot less than those other four teams complaining or asserting, we need the system platform team, get it to us. The second of these three intermediaries is what I'll call a translator. Someone who takes your system, translates it into a different language or a different framework so that other people using that framework have access to it. Oh my goodness, frameworks, it's time to talk about the big, big, difficult questions. Are you a React shop, a Vue shop, an Angular or Ember tool set? Many teams grapple with this, and it provokes the question from a systems team, are we going to embed our system into one of those frameworks, or are we going to release maybe just vanilla HTML and CSS? It's going to be up to the squads themselves to translate it and use it in their own React platforms or their own Vue platforms, because we're trying to serve many people. And so start to think. If you have a system, and you have 30 product squads or so, and those product squads are among them 25 React teams, because they're all going through a big replatforming, and everyone is going React. If I see this ecosystem of products, absolutely. We're building a React-based component library, and the adoption of that library will be very direct to those customers. But what about the other ones? Sure, JavaScript is powerful. It encapsulates. It gets those developers what they want. But we've found, actually, that that tooling can be expensive to start up compared to a a vanilla system. We have to test more things. We have to be more rigorous. And that bottom line, unfortunately, what do they do? How do we serve them? We're here to serve everyone, right? Well, if we're separating our concerns, a first point of contact might be, while we can't give you all the UI components, maybe you can adopt our tokens to still apply the visual language 
consistently and evolve the application of that language as the tokens evolve too. But what if, like in a second of my three clients right now, you have a portfolio that looks like this. The organization is autonomous. Each team can make the choice around what framework they want to use. 10 are on React, 10 are on Vue, maybe there's a few on Angular, maybe there's the subset of content teams using Adobe Experience Manager. Well, then we're going to stay vanilla. We're going to have a front-end framework that is HTML and CSS, and it's going to be up to each of those individual teams to work. There are some great Vue and React developers out there, and some of them are highly modular in how they're organizing their code. So modular so that they're going to take their own product and separate it from another repository that is going to be their translation of your system into React, their translation of your system into Vue. And guess what? Once that team in the upper right or the lower right makes that translation, what do you think all those other teams are going to do? They're going to start looking at those. <laughs> I can either translate it from vanilla HTML myself, or I can use this React library. Duh, I'm going to use that. And so suddenly, your system looks like this. You have a vanilla HTML and CSS kit. Someone translated it out there in the community to React, and all of the React teams in one fail swoop are adopting something else. And so what that means to you propagating a system is, your customers are in the middle, and their customers are further away. And as you think about versions, because everything comes down to versions, that system React might be adopting version 1.1. But these customers, they're adopting this thing that's changing at different times, times that you don't control, times that, frankly, you might not have visibility into either. That React system might even translate what you have in your system as a lot of different components into a subset of components. They only offer 40% of what your system offers. They rename some components. In the heat of the moment, they're making their product, they're under deadlines. They call it a spinner when you called it a loader. Little icon spinning around and around. Maybe they added their own components, a carousel and a date picker. I don't want to talk about date pickers. I don't want to talk about carousels at all. If you're a designer, you know what I mean. Okay, That's why it's not in the system. But even more so, per component they did translate, they omit features. Is accessibility still fully supported? How is this thing documented? You have a conversation. That's me, that yellowish person in the upper left. Awesome, I'm so excited. You have a React button. That's, are, are you also going to make not just the primary one, but the secondary and the flat button variations too? And in Slack, somebody responds, person that made the React library, I, I don't need those things. OK, I noticed you're on 1.2.0. Our system's now on 1.9.0. It's been four months. Do you think you're going to upgrade? Because remember, their customers are all those React kits. Ha, huh, no. Um, I'm on deadline. I'm working on my product. I'm not going to be really working on this thing at all. And suddenly, your system, meant to serve 30, is now choked by their system that is stale and unchanging. So when you have these kinds of translators, praise the initiative. Look at them as a contributor. And they can potentially be a great part of your story, but know the risks, too. Know that their translation may be incomplete. It might miss components. It might have different, a different place for documentation if they document anything at all, as opposed to say, just look at the code and figure it out. That is not a system, by the way. They might not support it. They might not have time for their customers, all those other React teams, and they have no commitment to upgrade. And so that's the conversation I want to foster with a team like that when we're creating those relationships between one another. But then it invokes the question, and I, I encounter these folks in workshops from time to time. 
Why don't we make a system for all the systems? And we will get there. All of us here today are on an arc where these translations, these schemas, these taxonomies are going to enable us to describe not just a visual language and tokens, but our UI in general. And it will become easier and easier over time to do this. But oh my gosh, most people are just trying to stand up a single system. You're telling me you're going to be able to produce React and Vue and a vanilla HTML and they're all going to be threaded together. That sounds like a glorious utopia wonderland to most people right now. And what I hear, while there are tools that are making progress here, people have tried this and realized that their ambition far exceeded their capacity to do good things. And they pare back down. So takeaways, approach them cautiously, but with curiosity. Just like the kinds of values Gina talked about. Be open and try and foster that community. But if you can, you're a person that is dealing as a systems advocate with relationships and help them understand the relationships that they're going to have to work with too. And protect your brand. Your system's meant to be a big investment for 30 other teams. And if your system has a brand name, and they translate it into something that really isn't con uh, adhering to that identity of the brand, talk about it and make sure that it's part of the program or not. The last of these relationships are what I'll call themers. That's a team that takes your UI components and themes them for experiences that are distinct from maybe the core brand or, or brands or identities that your system supports. Imagine you make core components, and those components are used to create really complex components that are still reusable across a large page layout. And so you can see how this aspect of composability plays out in systems, small things into increasingly big things into the view that your end customer has. And in fact, there's perhaps a theme that you apply that changes the color palette, changes the typography, uses a different catalog of icons. And then you realize that your company, these are all separate teams doing each step of this process. This is a system of systems. This is a chain of dependencies and a chain of relationships, such that if you're the design system, we're supposed to be the thing meant for everybody. Well, you are, but you're still potentially one or two steps removed from those teams making those products for all of those different clients, in between which another team is responsible for theming and another team is responsible for what might be many of these big, composed, rich, complex components. So there are theming basics. I'm not going to teach you the intricacies of SAS and Mixins and all the other great tools that we have at our disposal and code and concepts we have for design. But there are certainly some baseline assumptions that you start to modularize what you have to separate stuff that you use globally across all of your catalog from things you, you identify for a specific component. And that you take those tokens and those became, become the first point in refactoring what a visual language is and propagating it easily everywhere else. So what are some takeaways? We've been approached by uh, groups within our big catalog or big portfolios of, say, 50 products, asking for theming features, asking for us to lift the technical capabilities to make theming easy. But you have to be careful because that's a whole subset of big things to build that add complexity to your system. And if it's really only for one team or two teams and you support 50, is that an architecture that's your responsibility or their responsibility. If you start to break down the problem, you can have meaningful discussions to make good decisions for that. But be careful of that request that says, I want to theme this stuff. Does your system support theming? And you say, OK, we need to support theming. And it turns out it's just for one person. Because that is perhaps taking you to a place that doesn't benefit uh, most widely. So that's things that get in between your system and those squads that use it. But like we heard about with Amazon and others, 
What if you're a company that has our system and there's another system? Is that okay? Are there competitors in the midst? Is someone offering a system as a replacement of what you offer? And if so, what does that mean? Teams have choices when they get started. If they're a product squad and they're not familiar with systems and they be at most loosely aware of what's going on with you, but they are very aware of a VP telling them what their date for delivery is, Bootstrap is a choice for them. Oftentimes, careful systems advocate in love with your own thing, sometimes that's the best choice for them, given where they're at and the goals they need to achieve. Another might be we don't have a language, we love, the VP loves material. That gets them further along in their initial work that they have. Is that a good choice? Just because you have a system doesn't mean that that's the wrong choice for them. Or do they have a bigger team? They're creating some new product at Amazon that nobody can talk about. Maybe it's up to them to create their own design language, to create their own system from scratch. Even though I would assume at a place like Amazon, the dot-com team, I hope, has a fairly robust system for the checkout path that takes one page because everything's super easy at Amazon. Why can't they just use that system? But maybe option three is a choice. So your option of using your system is actually a choice for them. And when it's a choice, Systems happen. Multiple systems happen. At Morningstar, I came to know them in late 2016. And when you start to work with a company, you start to learn about the history. And we realize that systems aren't one system or no systems. There are generations of systems. And while some people might talk about, in their case, Mad Hatter, they made this system, it was a repository in Bitbucket, and it was made for one of their big flagship products. They look at it as a failure, and I look at it as, it as a generation of learning, of figuring out how systems work, such that when they made Mui Bootstrap, based on the Bootstrap, Get Bootstrap framework that everybody, uh, most everybody's aware of, that it was better for it. They knew the mistakes they'd made, they chose a platform, and they started to expand who it's for. Not just that flagship product, but it's for everybody, whoever wants to use it. You can choose to opt in and use it as you want. But limited documentation, the visual style was aged, even using Bootstrap, it was riddled with accessibility challenges, both with color contrast as well as how the, the code worked. And so I got involved and we made a decision to create a Morningstar design system that was intended for everyone, over 50 products at their organization. And so do you look at those past ones as failure? I try to frame them as challenges and generations. And we will get there because I bet at Morningstar, I, I don't see the future there necessarily. 2019, is there gonna be another point along this generational timeline or not? We'll see. And so that Mui Bootstrap, the old one, 50 products or so, it had been adopted by 15, but now we had a new one. And it was endorsed by the CEO who taps us on the shoulder and says, what do you need from me to make this successful? It had, from the top down and the bottom up, an appreciation for a target market of system adoption of everybody. And so we made choices. We used BEM as a CSS naming methodology. And we use that as a way to characterize how things are gonna change. Yes, markup's gonna change. Elements are gonna change. Class names are gonna change. And we made a commitment. It was January last year, specifically January 25th. It was around two o'clock in the afternoon, day two of a two day, six month, essentially release planning session. The system team was formed. We chose BEM, we made all these other choices and we said, we're gonna do this. We're remaking this from the ground up. It's gonna be awesome. High five. Everyone was super excited. 
And then two hours later, one hour from the end of this two-day session where everyone had convened, one of the lead designers comes in and says, another team is making a library. That team's in London. It's going to be done, not in June, but like in, they say, in another couple sprints, maybe in March. And so they're one of the flagship teams that adopted Mui Bootstrap, that thing on the lower left of the diagram before. They're now thinking about adopting that instead. That was crushing to us because months before, we had already been talking about how the CEO tapped us on the shoulder and said, make the thing for everybody. And now somebody else on some other continent is making a different thing that is turning their eyes. Effectively, it was for their platform of products. They were making it called Mui C, Mui for components, because they were a team that made lots of components that other people used, and it seemed like a great generational name for Mui B. And then all of those other teams, and there were that many, were, had their heads turned to the other thing. Whereas we were supposed to be the one for everybody. What are we supposed to do? So we could put our heads down. We could make ours awesome, hope for the best. We could go on a marketing blitz. Our thing's going to be great. It's for everybody. The CEO said so. Or we could go to the CEO and say, why are they doing this? Stop them, please. You said we were supposed to do this. They're doing this. Stop them. Or we can just shrug our shoulders and sort of live with a couple because, you know, Amazon does it. They have lots of systems. <laughs> I don't know, maybe Spotify does and Google. And uh, No, Google has one system. So what do you do? You're all thinking, hopefully, you're all wondering, is it answer one? What's he going to say? Is it answer two? Maybe it's answer three, maybe four. So by a little polling device, maybe you'd all be typing in one, two, three, or four. Oh my gosh, pick up the phone. Part of working with systems, a big, or the biggest part of working with systems, isn't just people, but forming the relationships with people you don't know to figure these things out. I called the technical lead of that MUIC team. I said, we're making this thing, and the CEO wanted us to do it, and, and we were supposed to make it for everybody. You're making that thing. Did you know we're making this thing? No. Did you know, I saw your code, you're using BEM too, but you're using the old visual language and we're going to make it using the new visual language. And they, oh, oh that's probably not good. Oh, and you, so there are gaps in what they were doing. And ultimately, the old code that we knew we were going to retire, in coordination with the code they had emerging, this is what we went to that 4 p.m., that one day conversation. Oh my gosh, that looks like a refactorization of this one. The blue's old. It's inaccessible. What if we took all the people that were going to translate this or evolve this into the generation of this and the people making this, let's just make a bigger team. You're, you've already made the commitment. We'll get you your stuff better documented, but maybe it's going to take a little bit longer. So the challenges to us when we made the phone call and provoked the question of should we merge, we had to figure out how to deliver in a timely way. We had to revisit tooling and approach. Fortunately, we saw BEM in their stuff. Ours had BEM. That was a conversation we didn't need to have, but there were many we did. And we had to blend rituals across Europe and the United States. Like Gina said, I am a leader of teams that fosters open borders of design and engineering that can be done by anybody, engineers or designers. And so we had engineers from London, to Portland in the United States, which is West Coast, which gave us two hours of the day to have all our rituals. But the opportunities were agreed source of truth, removed redundancy within teams, improved lack of bias, because that team working on that platform where Mui C was going to be applied, we knew very little about, but they were an important customer of the whole system. And we had more people to make more things better. So, that's what happens when you have competition. What if, what if you have lots of competition? I respectfully disagree with Gina in that I see this a lot in organizations. All of these are not Salesforce lightnings, okay? They're all at different points in their generational journey. 
One might be simply a set of sketch assets, and the other might be a fully documented rich set of UI components and code and design and tokens and documentation and all of those things. But it's not uncommon for me to come in an organization and see these systems. A corporate organization that creates many microsites, investor sites, press sites, the marketing team that's responsible for the dot com and the entryway to acquire your product, and then that product organization that builds all those web and native and other applications, maybe a kiosk, maybe a handheld fulfillment device, and maybe all those underserved internet people making all the enterprise tools for their own in house teams. And it turns out we're not the top node. We are a system on the path to the people making products that inherits from brand two. I've not yet met a brand team that has design tokens, but they do have tokenizable design decisions. And frankly, they own them. And it's up to us working in a product organization to figure out if we're going to translate their, their somewhat flat orange, relevant for many platforms, into the more saturated, sophisticated orange we use in digital spaces or not. So we are not the top node, but I will say the product teams are on average in pretty good lockstep with brand, but marketing and certainly corporate tend to be in greater lockstep with brand. And unfortunately, those internal tools are just trying to fight the fight to make the thing work. And so there's lots of teams out there. They have lots of products that, and the scale of the different teams and squads and individuals that contribute to them are different. And does it look like in a bank, here's an example, you have a product org, they inherit from brand and they have their own core products for a bank, but then there are fiefdoms of native credit card line of business and consumer banking. And marketing and corporate, they're on their own own different path, and even other lines of business at a bank, and if you work in the United States, a lot of them look like this. Other fiefdoms, like business banking or consumer loans or institutional big financial transactions that are like huge amounts of money, have their own systems, and they're all directly inheriting from brands. So if you get dropped in, where are you? Are you here? And if so, how do you relate to everybody else? And if you relate strongly to some of them, what are you going to do about it to make those relationships better? I hear from internet teams, customers use the product organization system. It's better than ours. Shouldn't our employee tools use the same thing too? Maybe. In fact, the internal teams might get a great boost from the product organization system. And so you talk about, should we consolidate or not? Should we rationalize and remove all these redundant systems that serve, right now, sets of products that don't overlap, but frankly, all that could depend upon the same thing? And so you look at products and you look at intranets. First place I always go, color, typography, maybe icons. They look similar from a distance, but if you actually measured those color values, they're all different. And then you look at the components they all share. Yes, everyone probably has their own button design. They probably have designed what a form input looks like. But there are lots of things that are distinct too. Marketing and corporate sites need different components than say the product and the apps and the transactional things need. And so if you're gonna consolidate those together, what are the implications of that? They use different design tools. They have a different type of code base. They have a different team or even size of team, or frankly, have a team at all. And so as you rationalize them, be prepared that one choice of your system relating to their system is do nothing. Remain focused. Keep the workflow that you have humming along as best as it can and avoid the co costly change that you'll occur, not just in tooling, but culture and process and all of those other things that go along with it. It's not going to scale your design. It's, it's going to keep those redundant things in place. And designers and engineers yearn for some of these connections. Many of them do. And so it risks 
say, in an intranet organization that they can't use the shinier tools that maybe the product organization has. And so your second option is start a conversation about some of the things you offer. If you're really going to rationalize, maybe a first step is if there is an intranet system, can you start to depend upon the visual language? We have the token library. Maybe you start to depend on that in your code. Take all the variables in your repository and replace them with more semantic variables from the tokens that help the visual language find a way through. Or you retire one of them. And I position intranet as weaker here, as the retireable thing, because that's more often than not the value that the organization is placing on them by their relative investments, by their relative size, by their frequency of change. And so, essentially, this is like an acquisition. You have a stronger and a weaker set of participants in the conversation, even though as you rationalize, they're potentially going to still come together. And then the last one is, retire them both and build something new that they share. This is the least likely outcome because it's the most expensive and requires almost certainly some bigger change happening that you're going to hook in mer merging these two systems together. But it still invokes the same questions of rationalization, maybe not for a brand new visual language and UI component set, but still of people, of capacity, of teams, of relationships and community and how those different considerations are going to come together. And so takeaways, I, when I come into an organization like a bank or like another group that has a, a sort of a rich set of different relationships, and I try to draw the boundaries in a way that's aligned with what the team can achieve in the next 12 months or the next 18 months, because they see that big chart of all those relationships and they want to conquer the world. But you need to take that one step at a time and be realistic. I also, when I come in, I happen to be more aligned with teams making an investment. I'm a consultant. I'm not some in-house person. And so that team is investing in systems. And other teams that have, let's say, weaker system practices look at that, and they want to hook on. But that's a burden that we increase for our own system that we work on. And so you have to approach those relationships cautiously and let them make the assertive move. Demo that. Maybe the internet team is willing to pay a cost to adopt a system that they don't get it for free, but to essentially have some currency, some exchange, they need to bring something to the table too. So I write on these things a lot. Uh, if you haven't visited, I talk about these and other concepts on Medium, from strategy and planning to documentation and so on. So find me on Medium there. And like Gina said, I hope to see you on Design Systems Slack, where we can talk about all the different topics that go on within design systems together. So thank you very much.